Hello, as you guys know, this is the unit on reform. Reform means to change, right? So uh, we've got to change something. Well, that's still something we hear about today, and it was definitely something that we heard about during the 1800s. So uh, this lesson on reform is about abolition, uh, and then tomorrow's will be that way as well. So the abolition movement, usually my students uh, during this unit are like, oh my gosh, this is so different than what I ever learned uh, in middle school, and that certainly is going to be the case today. You're going to see some things that will surprise you, which is why the screen says abolition movement. It's not as simple as we like to think. Uh, all right, so in the abolition movement, okay, things that we want to remember, uh, who are the leaders of the movement? Like, so who are the famous people, uh, and what did they do to go about to try to make this reform happen? Uh, because remember, there's no social media back then. So uh, what is colonization? And did it work? Why or why not? Okay, people's views on issue change over time, right? And for you to think about, is that okay? Is it okay for you to change your mind about something? Uh, and then who believed in abolition in 1830? So the Civil War, just you know, heads up, starts in 1861. Okay, the Declaration of Independence was 1776. The Constitution was 1789. You know, we studied all that stuff up to Jackson. That was till like 1824. And then the age of Jackson was 1824 to yeah, roughly 1836. So this is 1830. This is right in the middle of that, right? Who believed in abolition, in the abolition of slavery uh, at that time? All right. So slavery in America. In 1810, there was about 1.2 million slaves in the United States. By 1830, there were 2 million. So it almost doubled, okay, in about 20 years. By 1860, there were 4 million slaves. Okay, and the slave trade had, had ended. Okay, so what you have to remember about slavery, and sometimes you'll hear throughout, you know, uh, people's arguments about slavery, they'll say, well, slavery existed in other countries, and slavery existed here, and slavery existed there. That's true. We were one of the rare places where slavery existed in perpetuity. What that means is that if I am a slave, then, then I have children, then all of my children are slaves. Okay, so that population continued to grow and grow and grow. Okay, so the owners, you see in red there, uh, the owners encouraged marriage. Well, of course they did, because that meant the more children you had, the more slaves that they had. Okay, and the slaves were property. Slavery is owning human beings. Okay, and that's what was going on, right? The plantation owners owned human beings. It was, they were property to those plantation owners. Okay, it seems crazy to think about now, but that's the way that it was. Uh, okay, so Eli Whitney is a guy that in 1793 invented the cotton gin. And what the cotton gin did is it separated the seed from the cotton. So literally you'd get like a cotton ball, okay, and that cotton ball would have a little bitty seed in the middle of it. So you have to pick the cotton ball off the field. So the cotton plant is sticky, it's, it's prickly, like it will cut your fingers, you got to wear gloves to pick it. I mean, it's not easy. It's very labor intensive. So you'd have to pick it off of the cotton plant. Okay, and then you have to bring it in and you got to pull that seed out, right? Well, Eli Whitney invented this cotton gin that automatically separated the seeds. Basically, it like you roll the thing and it kept the seeds on this side, okay? And then the, it was like a comb almost. The seed would stay over here and then the cotton would end up over on that side, okay? So before you had to pick the cotton, then pull the seed out by hand. It was extremely labor intensive. So it took a long time to pick it. It took an even longer time to pull the seeds out of it. You're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of cotton, little cotton balls to do that with. So it took a lot of slaves to do that, and you couldn't plant too much of it, right? So Eli Whitney creates this cotton gin. People are like, oh, it's going to be great because now you don't need half the slaves anymore. So this may be, you know, we could not need slavery, right? A lot of people probably weren't thinking that at all, but they thought at least it would decrease the need for it. The opposite happened. Okay, so after the cotton gin, instead of reducing the number of slaves, the plantation owners just planted more cotton, and the slaves picked all the cotton in the field, okay, and they needed the slaves to pick the cotton in the field, and then the gin separated the seed from the cotton. So what that meant was, since cotton was so profitable, that the southern plantation owners, they planted an enormous amount of cotton, okay, because now they could take that cotton and sell it overseas, like in the tariff of 1828, when they were mad about that, they wanted to sell stuff to England and France, because that's how they made their money in the southern part of the United States. Okay, so what I have here on the screen is you got the red box, well, the red box, you, that's what 
they that's the amount of slave area that they excuse me that's the amount of cotton area that they used to grow so that area that's red they used to grow that much of cotton so after the cotton gin became um, a, a thing an invention then they would replace they replaced what they used to grow in red with what they grow now in blue what that meant was you could make more money buy more slaves plant more cotton so it didn't make the need for slaves go down. In turn, the opposite happened. It made the demand for slaves go up, which meant they're going to have more slaves in the southern part of the United States, right? So a lot of times people are like, well, what about the North? The North, why didn't the North have slaves? Well, it wasn't some moral obligation by the North. It wasn't like the North was like, oh, this is terrible. No, the North didn't need slaves. They didn't have cotton. They couldn't grow cotton. Okay, so they didn't they didn't need slaves. They grew corn and they could grow corn and have their family have a big enough, enough people to pick their own corn and do all that because it wasn't nearly as labor intensive as picking cotton. So the northerners didn't have a need for slavery. Therefore, they didn't have it. The bad news and the reality is that if they had cotton in the north and they needed the slaves, guess what? They probably would have had slaves in the north too. Okay, but they didn't because they didn't have those crops. All right, so in the north, we have what we call the American system, and this was kind of the essay from the last or the first test. Okay, the north had factories and farms. The south had cotton and tobacco. The west had the frontier, and that was for the growing population of people to move to the west. Well, as they moved to the west, if they came from the south, they're probably going to take slavery with them. If they came from the north and didn't have slaves, they're probably not going to take slaves in, in their new area. So what happened is you extend across the country, okay, you got people south, like in the Missouri Compromise, that are slave states, and then above it, okay, are free states. So you might notice on the screen that some of these are red. Well, if they're red, like that's the really important stuff for you to know. So as you take notes, which I highly encourage you to do, uh, make sure you have the red stuff and you understand that, okay? Uh, all right, so this picture, you got to take a good look at it. And probably some of you are like, man, I've seen that somewhere. That is in the Lincoln Library in Springfield, Illinois. What you see in the background is a slave auctioneer. And you can see that the husband, the dad, is in shackles. Okay, he's being sold off and looks like he's trying to stay and they're pulling him away. And it looks like the boy in the middle is getting sold off too because he's got all of his mom's dress. He doesn't want to leave his mom. Okay, what you see there happened, like that took place, that's real. Okay, now the people aren't real, it's a statue in the Lincoln thing, and this is a picture of that that I took years ago. Okay, that these kind of slave auctions occurred, not just, you know, in some deep southern states, this occurred all over the country. Okay, in fact, if you know where the old courthouse is in St. Louis, like in deep center field at the baseball stadium, they had slave auctions there as well. Okay, this is not a pleasant part of American history, but it certainly happened, right? Well, some people started to say, yeah, I don't know about this, right? This doesn't seem like it's okay, right? So those people were called abolitionists because they wanted to abolish slavery and get rid of it, okay? This guy was one of the leading guys, right? He's African-American that escaped slavery, okay? Um, he started what's called, actually, that's not him. Yeah, it is. That's Frederick Douglass. We'll talk about him in just a minute. Um, before we do that, we'll talk about this, okay, the American Colonization Society. They, what this group wanted to do, and they had good intentions here, okay, what they wanted to do was take the slaves, free them, and then pay for them to return to Africa, okay? So they could return to Africa, and they could go back to Africa, and then they'd be fine. That was the idea, okay? Well, uh, this actually started a country, okay, today in West Africa, there's a country called Liberia. The capital of Liberia is Monrovia. It was named Monrovia in 1831. And if you take out the via, you're left with Monroe. Well, guess who that's named after? James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States. Okay, so America started what is still today, the country of Liberia. That's why uh, it's one of the few countries in Africa that are, is a mostly Christian country because it started with American, freed American slaves. Okay, but that presented a lot of problems for the people that went. Um, there was a lot of people that were like, well, wait a second, like, you can send me back to Africa, right? 
but I'm, I mean, you sent me to Liberia, but that was four generations ago when my family was brought over here on slave ships. Okay. I don't know if they came from Liberia or if they came from Senegal or if they came from Angola. Like I have no idea where they came from, but you're sending me back to Africa. Right. So for example, I'm Irish. Okay. My family's Irish. It would be like saying, you're going to send me back to Europe and then you send me to Italy. Well, what, that doesn't do me any good to go back to Italy. I wouldn't be able to speak the language. I wouldn't know the culture. You know, my grandma came here. It was only two generations ago. It was less than a hundred years ago that my grandma came here. Okay. But sending me back to Europe would be like sending somebody back to Africa. We didn't know where they came from. Okay. So there were people though inside the United States that believed it. So I'm going to read this next slide to you. Right. Uh, here's what it says. I've said that the separation of the races is the only perfect preventative of amalgamation. I have no right to say all the members of the Republican Party are in favor of this, nor to say that as a party they are in favor of it. There is nothing in their platform directly on the subject, but I can say a very large proportion of its members are for it, and that the chief plank in their platform, platform opposition to the spread of slavery, is more favorable to that separation. Such separation, if ever affected at all, must be affected by colonization. And no political party as such is now doing anything directly for colonization. Party operate, operations at present only favor or retard colonization incidentally. The enterprise is a difficult one, meaning slavery, but when and colonization. But when there is a will, there is a way. And what colonization needs most is a hearty will. Will springs from the two elements of moral sense and self-interest. Let us be brought to believe it is morally right and at the same time favorable to or at least not against our interest to transfer the African to his native clime or climate. And we shall find a way to do however great to do it, however great that task may be. The children of Israel to their numbers as to include 400,000 fighting men went out of Egyptian bondage in a body. So they did it then, and we can do it now. If there's a will, there's a way to make it happen. Okay, so that quote, right, clearly supports colonization and sending uh, freed slaves back to Africa, right? Now, the question is, who said the quote? So think about that. Who do you think said that? You probably recognize Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, the Abraham Lincoln. Okay, the the great emancipator, the guy that freed the slaves in 1863 and made it official in 1865. He, and I think that quote was from like 1852, he believed in colonization. There were other people that believed in colonization, okay, of sending them back. There clearly there were people saying, okay, this system isn't working. We need to we need to get rid of it. Okay, we need to get rid of the system so that it's gone. And if that means colonization and sending them back then to Africa, then that's what we'll do. Okay, that was Abraham Lincoln's views, right? He changed his views over the course of time. People that are wise change their views on things, okay, no matter what that may be. And you guys will too. Whatever you believe in now probably is going to change as you go through uh, your life. All right, so American colonization didn't work. Why or why not? Well, it didn't really work because, number one, it was expensive. Number two... The slaves didn't really want to go, and that sounds weird, but they didn't really want to go because where are they going, like I mentioned earlier, okay? Uh, All right, heroes and their reaction uh, as far as the whole reform movement goes. Theodore Weld was a revivalist, right? So he preached and used fiery speeches, okay, to convert people to abolition, right? He saw slaves as brothers in Christ, which a lot of Quakers, which was a religious group, that they were a part of this as well. All right. He was chased out of most places. Okay, they visited, but converted thousands of people in the process. Right. He was married to a lady named Angelina Grimke. Okay, who you're going to read about in tomorrow's lesson. Okay, so he was married to Angelina Grimke. Uh, They were both abolitionists. And the weird part about this is, like, where do you think that he lived at? If he got chased out of most places, right? He probably lives in Charleston, South Carolina. Or he lives in Nashville, Tennessee, or he lives somewhere in the South where there's slavery. No. He lived in Philadelphia. He lived in the North. And he was speaking out against slavery and getting chased out of town. People threatening him. That's scary. That's the North, not the South. 
All right. So other heroes, Elijah Lovejoy. Okay. You may have, if you've ever been on campus at SIUE, they have an Elijah Lovejoy library. Okay. There's a Lovejoy high school uh, near here. I don't even know if it's still in existence. I think it is. Maybe it's a middle school now, uh, but that's who that's named after. He had a newspaper. Okay. It's called the St. Louis Observer. He was killed in Alton, Illinois. Yeah. Alton, Illinois, like 15 miles north of here. Okay. Defending his printing press. Printing press was what made the newspapers. Okay. He had been kicked out of St. Louis uh, for writing about a lynching of a black man. He wrote about it and the locals didn't like that. So they kicked him out of St. Louis and he went to Alton, Illinois. Uh, he had a total of four printing presses destroyed before he got murdered. Okay. So if you've ever driven through Alton, there's a big grain silo that sits right down on the river. This happened just to, I guess that would be the South. Yeah. Just to the South of that. It was kind of a park there today. Um, but Elijah Lovejoy was, was murdered for his uh, abolitionist newspaper, The Observer, uh, and its views. So there's a picture of him. All right. Here's another hero. Okay. A guy named William Lloyd Garrison. Okay. He had a newspaper in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston, Massachusetts, which is like the most progressive part of America because Harvard's there. All these other universities are there. People are very well educated. Okay. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison was from Boston. Okay, it had the Liberator. He was hung in effigy. What that means is that they made a dummy of his body, wrote Garrison on the back of it, and drove it around the town in the horse and buggy with a noose around his neck. Now, they didn't really kill him, okay, but that's how they treated him in Boston, Massachusetts. So the view that you had in middle school that, like, everybody in the North was against slavery and everybody in the South was for slavery and the northerners were all like oh you know slaves come to the river and come across the rocks and grab my hand and i'll pull you to freedom that's all baloney that didn't happen that way were there northerners that were one of the free slaves for sure there were but if there's people trying to kill this guy in boston okay for supporting abolition that's in boston you couldn't get any further away from the south okay so that's not, the, the Northerners weren't saints here, okay, historically speaking. They, they supported the idea of slavery just as, not just as much, but they supported the idea. They didn't, a lot of them did not want it to end, okay? All right, there's William Lloyd Garrison. There's the guy they hung in effigy and drug him around the streets in Boston, okay? All right, so emancipation, this is definitely something you got to understand. Uh, Abolition of slavery would lead to this. Emancipation is the freeing of the slaves, so no more. Like the Emancipation Proclamation, that was in 1863. That's not this unit, but it's coming. Okay, so David Walker is another guy. This guy was a free black man in the North. So this is weird again, but there were free black men in the South. Okay, and like Frederick Douglass was married to a freed black woman, right? His first marriage, okay, before she died. So the, the, the rules are not cut and dry here that like a lot of us like to think of. So this guy, David Walker, he was militant, and he wanted all the blacks to fight against their oppressors. So he wanted a total slave uprising. He wanted North, northern blacks to go back to the south and fight against slavery. Okay, this guy was hated in the north. Yeah, in the north. Okay, so... In the northern states, there were not there was not support a large amount of support to end slavery. Okay, there were some these people that I'm showing you, but not a large majority of. Them. In fact, they wanted to kill this guy, okay, for for being an abolitionist, all right, a militant one. All right, so here's Frederick Douglass. He escaped from slavery, okay, and he published his newspapers called the North Star. Knowing all the newspaper names and their publishers would be a good idea. Uh, it's called the North Star. Why the North Star? Because when you escaped from the South, if you at nighttime, which is when they did their movement, you could see the North Star, you knew you were going the right direction. So he, after he gained his freedom, he decided to name his newspaper the North Star. Okay. All right. So the Underground, you've heard of this before, right? The Underground Railroad. It's not really a railroad. There were no trains. Okay. It was a secret passageway. So the slaves went from the South to the North or sometimes even as far as Canada. Okay. Like if you've seen the movie Harriet Tubman, that's where she went. Okay. It was into Canada. It's a really good movie, by the way. It's not totally historically accurate, but it's a good movie. Uh, okay. So Harriet Tubman's nickname was Black Moses. 
Okay, you guys have seen Harriet Tubman. I know my kids over the years come home from school every year with something about Harriet Tubman, which is fine. But they de you definitely get Harriet Tubman uh, at some point in school. So she was nicknamed Black Moses, right? Okay, so this is a map of the Underground Railroad, and you can see uh, how people would escape here. Okay, the arrows take all coming out of the south, going up to the north. Uh, people leaving, they're even going to the west, right? The, the slaves are trying to get away, right? That's their answer because they don't think they're ever going to knock down the system that's been set up in the south, that system being slavery. Uh, okay, so Harriet Tubman. When you see this, it's like three minutes long. I want you to think about what you already knew and what you know about her now, okay? And then what surprised you about this video? So the movie, by the way, is called Harriet, and I thought it was really good. Uh, Mrs. Horner saw it. She did not like it. It wasn't uh, accurate enough for her, but I thought it was pretty darn good. It has a lot of the facts from this little clip in it. Harriet Tubman began her life in the bonds of slavery, but lived her life helping others achieve their freedom. She really helped black people have a sense of um, self, a sense of freedom, and a sense that, you know, slavery was not right. Araminta Harriet Ross was born into slavery around 1820 in Dorchester County, Maryland. As a child, she was loaned out to different plantations. By the time she turned 12, she was working in the fields. When she was a young teen, she suffered a severe injury, which would affect her for the- Okay, so a couple of notes there. What you see in the background, right? That's cotton, those are cotton plants. This is not from the 1830s, right? That we didn't have cameras yet. So this comes later on, probably after the Civil War, to be honest with you. Um, and they're going to tell you here that she gets hit in the head and it causes her basically to have like seizures okay throughout her life for the rest of her life a slave owner threw a metal weight at another slave and accidentally hit her in the head for the rest of her life she suffered epilepsy terrible headaches but she also had these strange visions which she ascribed to god communicating to her she took these visions as a symbol of her mission, like Moses, to go and free her people. In 1844, she married John Tubman, who was a free black man. A fairly common occurrence in Maryland, Harriet was determined to escape her life of slavery. Okay, so she married John Tubman, who was a free black man. So she was a slave, he was free, they got married, right? Which again, like our brain, when we stop and think about that, are like, well, then why didn't she just leave with him? Like, why, you know, leaving in those days was not easy. This Underground Railroad was not easy to get away. Like, it wasn't like today where, heck, it's, you know, if it's noon, you could be in California by 5 o'clock in today's world. It wasn't that way back then. And in 1849, she finally did it. She risked her life by making her way from Maryland to Philadelphia. She followed the North Star and used the so-called Underground Railroad to make it to freedom. The Underground Railroad was an organized group of free blacks, whites, and Christian abolitionists who helped slaves escape to the North. Harriet had made it to the promised land. No one would have blamed her if she never returned to the South, but she desperately wanted to free her family. She made perilous trips back to free her two brothers, her sister, and her sister's two children. When she made a third trip to get her husband, she found he had taken another wife. Instead of returning with her husband, she saved more slaves. Oh. So she went back 
and found out that her husband had married somebody else. Okay, because he was free and he, I guess it depends on what you believe historically, but he thought, oh, well, she's gone. She's not coming back. And he married somebody else. So he moved on. Right now, imagine that if you're her, you're doing all this to free your family. And then you come back and your husband is like, see ya. Okay, that had to be tough, but that didn't stop her. Not only did she escape slavery and achieve freedom for herself, but she went back down into the South to bring freedom to dozens of other slaves. Harriet was clever as she was brave, figuring out countless tricks to bring many slaves to freedom over the next several years. The fact that she developed these paths and trails that took people through the country and they traveled at night and they used quilts to, to have secret codes and, and know the paths and then to bring people north across the Mason-Dixon line into Ohio um, to find freedom. So she was a pioneer and I think a very, very strong woman. Her legendary status as an underground railroad conductor earned her the nickname Moses. Well, I think Harriet Tubman's uh, name, Moses, you know, comes from Moses from the Bible, leading people to freedom, and it's a very, very proper name, I think, for her, and, and one that she definitely lived up to. In 1850, things became more dangerous for Harriet when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed. Instead of being a free woman, she was now a fugitive. She continued to free slaves, but now guiding them to Canada so they could truly be free. From 1851 to 1857, Harriet lived mostly north of the border in St. Catharines, Canada. She continued to make trips to Maryland twice a year to save more slaves. Besides her work as a liberator of slaves, Harriet spoke in support of anti-slavery and women's rights. Her efforts made her a wanted woman with a bounty on her head, but she was never turned in. She aided abolitionist John Brown with his plans for the raid on Harper's Ferry. During the Civil War, the government asked her to help the Union cause by organizing a network of spies among black men in the South. Not only was she known as the great liberator, but she also assisted the Union army going down on patrols and advising Union officers on how best to attack the South. Out in the trenches, she also helped Colonel James Montgomery disrupt Southern supply lines, which resulted in the freedom of hundreds of slaves. After the war, Harriet dedicated herself to establishing schools for freed men in South Carolina. Even though she couldn't read or write, she understood the value of education. In so just think about that, what that just said. Establishing schools for freedmen, okay, in the 1870s and 1880s in South Carolina. If she would have done that and everybody would have joined her and we would have educated everybody and offered an education for everybody, okay, in the South in those days, uh, I think a lot of our problems today might not be problems because people would have been more educated. So we would have saved African Americans a lot of problems for the next hundred years or so. In her later years, Tubman worked with her friend, Susan B. Anthony, to support the cause of women's suffrage. Harriet Tubman is relevant today, not only for her work in terms of racial justice, but also in terms of women's rights. After the Civil War, she became an outspoken supporter for the suffrage movement. Get women the right to vote. To help make ends meet and continue to help the causes she believed in, she worked on a book called Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman. In 1908, she established a home for older poor African Americans in Auburn, New York, which she moved into in 1911. She okay, so just some context. This is 1911 where she moves into this retirement home. The Civil War 
started in 1861. So somebody that was born in 1861 would have been 50 years old when she's moving into this retirement home. Okay. One that she started. I mean, the woman is unbelievable. Okay. Amazing. The different stuff that she did. And don't forget at the end of the Jackson unit, uh, we had a, at the end of the Jackson PowerPoint the other day, you had to think about the $20 bill. Well, this is who they're talking about replacing Andrew Jackson with uh, on the $20 bill. She lived there till her death in 1913 from pneumonia. She was buried with full military honors. All right, so uh, she's a remarkable, remarkable person. And we'll continue with with this on abolition here that takes a while for my computer to get back so what did you see in the video that you already knew and then what did you learn that surprised you okay in that video all right so um there we go. all right so this is kind of a review of the things you did we talked about colonization talked about heroes like theodore well william lloyd garrison yep that's my phone uh, Elijah Lovejoy, Frederick Douglass, right? They're newspapers. Don't forget all that stuff. Um, and then these are the questions that we started with. So who were the leaders of the movement and how did they go about trying to make reform? Remember, that's change. What is colonization and did it work? Why or why not? And then people's vis views on issues change over time, right? So in 1830, man, nobody wanted anything to do with this. But by 1865, everybody was, most everybody was on board with this. Okay, and are there things today that people at the beginning are like, oh my gosh, no way. And then over the course of time, they change their mind and they say, yeah, that'd be a good reform. Certainly that happens. Okay, and then who believed in abolition in 1830? So who thought it was a good idea? And I don't want those heroes, right? What I'm really asking there is like, did a lot of people believe that abolition was a good idea in 1830? Um, so keep that in mind uh, as you finish up there to review. Okay. All right, so that's the end of this.